I was living in the moment, yeah. just trying to recover and then trying to, um, you know, just sort of become uh, focused on my my path and my future and not, mm. um, you not know, the past. constantly looking back. And people would ask, well, why does your face look like that? Or why are you limping? Why do you, why are you always in a cast? Or why this, why that? And I'd just go, I was in a, an accident. I wouldn't get then into you the... Then you tell this whole story again and again. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And then um uh and then it was interesting because I was supposed to do the TED talk on uh an education thing, so I had this uh tool in my other company, Synaptic Mash for mm -hmm. personalization and um then they did looked at my bio and they went, um, you know, we'd we'd rather hear you talk about your personal life right now and then we'll do We'll, we'll still do the education thing, but um, so like right beforehand, I'm like, oh my God, I they spent a it. month. Yeah, I spent a month getting ready for the TED Talk on the Ed, and then I had 15 minutes to write, you know, something up and then just tell my story. And so I was, I just blurted it just out. Did there. It. it was great, though. It really was great. Um, oh, sometimes you. that's the best because it just comes from your heart and what you remember and what you feel at the time. So, yeah. yeah. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm very excited. We have Ramona Pearson. She's co-founder of Declara. Declara is a learning technology that bridges artificial intelligence, neuroscience, and algorithms that are under lock and key. And it's all to deliver personalized information for learning, which Ramona will talk about. Previously, Ramona was founder of Synaptic Mash, which was acquired by Promethean for an estimated $10 million. Her vision now is to bring neural and clinical sciences into modern day learning. And her inspiration actually comes from having to relearn absolutely everything from walking to talking to eating and even breathing, which we'll, which we'll talk about and hear about. And she is truly the perfect example of the phrase triumph of the human spirit. Ramona, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with you. Me too. And, and I always like to start with a fun fact that most people don't know about you. And you have a million fun facts, actually. Some traumatic fun facts. Uh, one traumatic fun fact is about your paraphasia. And what have you said before that, well, what is paraphasia? What have you said before and how it came out? You know, it's, it's interesting because I do so many public speeches and I talk all the time and mentor people all the time. And they probably notice that periodically my, I'll grab the wrong noun. And what a paraphasia is, is my brain is searching for a word. And because I've had uh, a traumatic brain injury, some of the pathways to that word have been broken. And so the brain's going, taking a longer route to get it. So sometimes it gets lazy and grabs the first word in its path. And so periodically while I'm giving a speech, I might just say, hey, you know, I was hit by a drunk shower or something ridiculous. And people just ignore it <laughs> and fill it in with their own own mind I suspect and I think that's the power of the gestalt so that we we correct what uh, somebody else might have had wrong but it is a strange thing sometimes when you grab the wrong word and put it out there and you also raced tandem bikes which apparently I didn't know until you told me usually race in Russia because it's not allowed in the US because you go so fast and what happened you got on a single bike the first time you went to race on a single bike, what happened? Yeah, so on tandem bikes, you'll see people race them in the United States like crazy out in the street or um, all over, or just ride them. But uh, the track racing, they 
they had problems with because of the speed and the danger. So I raced with the um, Masters Cycling and went to Europe and did international racing. And in Russia, they had the World Championships. So I raced there quite a bit and with phenomenal athletes. But um, when I came back to the United States and I had brain surgery and ended up with a, a new cornea so I could see out of my one eye, I suffered from depth perception issues. I still do. Periodically, I trip downstairs that I can't see. Um, Scary, yes. But yeah, so I was in one, my first race. I was in South Carolina, and I realized I was starting to get close to someone, but I could not tell exactly how close I had come. So nicked the uh, person's tire in front of me went over the handlebars and slammed right on the eye I had just fixed. Oh, so, God. So everybody was thinking I would lose that eye again, but, you know, fortunately I just uh, uh, collapsed my eye socket. So, you know, <laughs> it's, un it's... To you, that's nothing. For most people, that's a lot. You know, because yeah. they had to do put titanium in your eye to rebuild it, or what did they do? Yeah, they went ahead. At first, it was, you know, I, I have these horrible pictures of myself. But at first, they were hoping that uh, the gap would heal itself. But then they had to get in and uh, bridge the cleft <laughs> with some uh, yeah. other material. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. it's amazing what they can do. And I'm always uh, a fan of, of innovation because every time I destroy something in my body or mm. some body part falls off, they could just keep replacing That's amazing. them. amazing. Yeah. And we'll go back and fill people in. If they haven't watched your TED Talk, they should because um, it, it talks about We'll talk about it here a little bit too. But, I mean, the there's so many fun facts because, I mean, they're not even fun facts. They're, they're traumatic facts. But, um, you know, over 50 surgeries. And what's remarkable is you never take time off. And no matter how many titanium parts you have or broken bones or cadaver parts, you train for triathlons, you compete, and we'll talk about you know what what keeps you moving, what keeps you motivated. Um, but I want to go back to early on. Where are you from? What was it like growing up? You know, um, I grew up in Southern California, but uh, every few years my parents moved and uh, we ended up living in Texas for a while. I've got a really funny story there. Go ahead, um, yeah. Well, you know, my parents put us into a Catholic school, St. Louis Catholic School. And, um, this is in Texas? Yes. And, you know, we're, we grew up basically with no religion. And I have a Jewish mother. So, you know, we go into uh, the Catholic school. And, of course, on Wednesdays they have everybody go into, um, I don't even remember what it is, but you go into the church and you get your little... Uh, bread token mm -hmm. and um, so while everybody is getting that they put the Jewish girl and the Baptist girl at the back of the church and uh, because we weren't Catholic and so as I looked up I saw Jesus on the cross and I go who's that guy and um, that a Baptist, <laughs> he, she said that's a Jew and that's what they do with bad Jews in the county <laughs> So. Uh, maybe I shouldn't laugh at that, but it's pretty funny. <laughs> I remember I went home, told my dad, asked while I was in school, and I told him. And then, you know, his response was, okay, don't be bad. Because <laughs> that will happen to you. So he never corrected that. You know, he just took advantage of the whole That's situation. probably smart as a kid. you get, you got to get all the leverage that you have on the kids. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I was terrified every day at school. Um, but yeah, my dad was like the mad scientist. So, you know, we, we didn't really have the, um, was your dad you know, a scientist? What did he yeah, do? He was, he was uh, an electrical mechanical engineer mm. and did propulsion science. Um, my uncle worked for NASA for 30 years. So wow. what we, you know, we grew up in a way that, um, you know, back in those days, your parents enjoyed martinis and cigarettes all the time. I'm survived. I can't believe I survived. Right. <laughs> Those were the times, so, yeah. 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 So, um, but he also encouraged us to uh, experiment all the time and to be innovators. And mm -hmm. 
he'd teach us how to build rockets and grenades and other things that would get us thrown into jail today. And, so what was uh, the craziest stuff that you would build with your dad or work on? Um, actually, my older brother. So my older brother decided to take one of our little bombs that uh, we learned how to create and take it to the Spanish class and basically set the class on fire. <laughs> Like, we would have been kids that no school would allow in today. <laughs> like it, yeah. But in those days, everybody was like, oh, they're creative. So uh, not that my teachers liked it, my brother or I either. They'd always go, oh, you're Richie's little sister. And they were horrified. You had a bad, <laughs> yeah. bad path to, uh, to, yeah. to fill. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I think that parenting and schooling is a lot different today and um, but I don't know if we would have grown to be as creative if we had the, uh, the so much structure and and everything to like we do today. Yeah. So, so it I sounds try. like even from an early age, even like obviously with Declare is about learning. Even then, you were learning differently. You're doing a lot of hands-on stuff and innovation and kind of creativity. Yeah, exactly. So with Declare, what I thought is um, there's a couple of premises. So in my last company, we had an assessment tool, and we were always trying to look at best ways to uh, create competency-based learning, and we brought uh, cloud-based learning before people were putting things in the cloud. So everybody thought we were crazy, and then uh, we were just ahead of the time by about three years. And mm -hmm. But here at Declara, what we've done is I realized that we're getting so much data. There's no need to assess anyone. We have all that unstructured data around how people search, how people interact, the conversations they have around topics. Mm -hmm. All of those things are much richer. So you get a 360-degree view of a person around their intent yeah. and their interest in learning. And so... What we're trying to do is also inspire serendipity mm. and curiosity. And so I'm bringing much of my childhood into the product. And, and that's why we, we leverage a lot of the, the um, NLP and the algorithms to help surface people and content, but allow the collective intelligence of humans to actually create the insights and share those insights with each other because that's where the serendipity is going to come across. Yeah. And Ramona, early on, I remember reading an article and it said when you did math, you would see things in a different way and be able to calculate things in your head. When did you realize that you had a gift when it came to math? Um, probably never. Never? <laughs> I always thought that everybody saw things that way really? so um you always perceive the world through your own lens and so i but then i realized you know as especially my partner and other people would say you know people don't see the world the way you do and don't image the world the way you do mm -hmm. and as a blind person i really depended on that ability so it was a gift for me to be able to uh navigate and if you watch kids that are born blind, the way that they're able to move around and walk around and interact with their mm -hmm. space without using a cane or a dog, it's because they're highly tuning into uh, the gifts that we have, and yet vision gets in the way of that. So vision is 83% of your sensory input. So if you weren't distracted by vision, you would actually use other senses. Yeah. And yeah. so for whatever reason, I um, was tapping into that before I lost my sight. Mm. And it was a gift for me when I had lost my sight. So what was one of the feats you remembered from an early age that someone else was amazed with because you were able to just, just do it like that? Um. Well, one of them was actually predicting nanotechnology before nanotechnology even became a word. And I was writing a, and I could actually see algorithmically how we would have to create that. So, you know, I, I think differently than most people. It's not like I'm uh, sitting there thinking about how uh, try to quickly get the mathematics done, but it's more or less see the world mathematically so that we, like I believe that everything we, we're doing 
can be um, expressed mathematically. Right. And, and so what I try to do is try to replicate the brain as much as possible. So a lot of uh, um, the neural nets are taking clusters of neurons and replicating them mathematically and then using that to actually read videos and things like that. So some of the, uh, the newer um, innovations coming into Declara is we're taking video right now. You won't see this for a couple of months, maybe three months, but mm -hmm. we're taking in video and then we're um, uh, using natural language programming to turn it all into um, uh, um, text and then allowing people to be able to create insights so that you can get insights. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, you could highlight things. You, could, you can actually physically go in and create insights, right? Yeah, now imagine doing that in video and then so instead of going to a MOOC and watching an hour and a half video, you can just go get the insights, maybe the three minutes that you need out of that. Right. And you could speed watch instead of having to listen to a boring lecture. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So if anyone checks out Declare, there is like a feature where when you're reading the article, you can actually highlight things highlight insights so the next person you can see what other people actually have is insightful so you can pretty much get through the article really quickly um based off of other people's insights right yeah 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 especially as you start to trust different people as experts in the areas you yeah. just go and speed read so there's a lot of innovation we're mm -hmm. going to start doing around those insights uh so right now you can put in PDFs and get insights, which was hard to do, because um, right. you have to tear apart a PDF and then reassemble it, and and articles, and you see how fast we ingest those articles. It's lightning fast, mm -hmm. and it's amazing how fast the algorithms read things. And then um, the collective intelligence of people is what really makes the magic. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, this may be a scary thing. I want to get inside your brain for a second. And um, when you say you were talking and thinking about nanotechnology before other people were, and you pictured different algorithms, how would you describe it to someone who obviously doesn't picture those things? Like, what are you seeing that's almost predicting and seeing nanotechnology before it, it comes about? Yeah, it's like, a, it's like I see what's happening, and then I can take the logical next steps, many steps out. So... Like, like are you seeing like mathematical equations in your like are you visualizing that or what's what's showing up in your brain when you're you're thinking about that? Yeah, it's hard to describe, yeah. but yeah. Um kind of. Like I can actually see the the innovation trail of things. It's weird. Um, it is weird, yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. So yeah, what else has that happened with besides nanotechnology for you that you just cuz it almost comes naturally that you just saw things unfold in your brain? Um, even even Declara, I mean, even Synaptic Mesh, I was too far forward. So the cloud technology, I was mm -hmm. like, everybody's going to store their data in the cloud. And believe me, when I went to school districts and was like, you don't need to have <laughs> servers, you don't need IT people, just give me all of your data. And everybody looked at me like I was insane. And I was looking at them as if they were insane. So it's like, you know, reptiles see two-dimensionally and humans see three-dimensionally. So a reptile won't see you coming around to pick it up like a, a lizard. So you go to grab a lizard and it's like the hand of God has grabbed it. <laughs> right, so, right. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. You know, imagine being um, a person who is fundraising and you're trying to tell the investors that they should invest in something they can't they can't understand and you can you don't have a name for yeah so even what we're doing in declara even though it's not that far out yet and i have to make sure i don't bridge us too far out into the future mm -hmm. it's going to be too crazy making it's hard for us to describe what what this is yeah. and because we're sort of ushering in the web 3.0 into right. the learning space where you know, Web 3.0, semantic, semantic web is basically around ubiquitous learning yeah. that you really don't need to uh, go through the machinations that we do to to learn. 
and yet we still use the, these old LMS tools and you know those are going to fall on the wayside in the next five years or so but it's really hard for different industries to realize that there's a newer way to um, to personalize learning experiences. Yeah, it is. And you know, when I was doing all the research and I spent a while trying to figure out how to perfectly describe in the introduction um, what Declara is, you know, because it's not just a learning technology, it's a lot more than that. So I was like, you know, if people like artificial intelligence is definitely in there, neuroscience is in there, and algorithms in there, whatever algorithms mean to kind of what your, your company does. Um, but I think it's a good time to talk about innovation. And what do you like? What's your idea of innovation right now? And you were talking about you kind of see things before they happen. I'm curious what is on the horizon for Declara, and in general, because it's a learning technology society essentially. So yeah. start with just innovation and talk a little bit about that. You know, innovation has been super important for me on a personal side. Like even, you know, when you see Uber and it's sort of remaking, um, you know, uh, um, transportation right. in a new way, an old technology and with a new business model, that's one way of innovating. And, and there's going to be a lot of industries that get remade that way. Yeah. Um, Steve Jobs made it really great with the iPhone. And no one could have... Five years before the iPhone came out, they could not have described it. How do you describe that? Well, it's right. this platform. You can talk in it, and it has all these apps on it. And what are those apps? You know, right. he would have sounded nuts. He just had to create it, get it in people's hands. And it's still hard for people to describe the iPhone. And yet, we just put a name to it and move on. Right. So, um, so it's fascinating to see how many industries are being created and when I had my accident um, somebody used a big pen and put it into my neck I read that, took yeah. out all the stuff so they basically took an old technology used it in a new way to save lives amazing but um, you know some doctors at that time also saw into the future Pack me in ice, which saved my brain, the cells from collapsing. Had they not done that, I wouldn't be here today, or I'd still be in a coma. Mm. Uh, so the the um, these doctors saw the future with. You said uh, at some point for that that was illegal, or something. Yes. I, so what was the illegal? FDA, the FDA hadn't approved it until like two thousand and six. So you couldn't put someone, like, lower their temperature? Is that what was illegal or what? Yeah, it just wasn't FDA approved. Wow. I'm talking about all the sort of common sense things that haven't been approved and, you know, that could save lives. And I think that some of that's starting to change because people are seeing the rapid um, transformation of yeah. medical technology right now and trying to keep up with it is hard. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, instead of, you know, just trying to fit yourself into a job anymore, it is a good idea to figure out how to innovate that next job. Like when people come into the company or my company, I, I try to encourage them to be innovators here. And it's hard because they're used to being in other companies where they're told what to do. Mm -hmm. And I would have loved that opportunity when I worked to been told invent something or innovate something. Yeah. And it's really hard for people to take off the shackles and, and use the their innovation. Mm -hmm. And you know, young people then should have gained those skills as being innovators in jobs to become innovators, innovative uh, entrepreneurs and create new jobs for more people. Yeah. Um, so, though I do have a collection called uh, Why Work? Because the future of the world may be we automate things and no one would work. But that's the consequence. Well, I guess we have to work to in order to get to that automation of work, right? Yeah, that's happening fast too. So how do you teach people that innovation or foster that innovation when they come in with those shackles? You know, it takes a lot of um, helping them to feel comfortable with risk taking mm -hmm. and which takes mentoring. So I, I enjoy mentoring people mm -hmm. because 
um, you know, they when you say that you can do this, they don't really believe you until mm -hmm. they do something that's so outside the box and then they get rewarded for it. Then they go, really? Now I'm going to constantly they work on the edge. Yeah, but it's really hard to bring innovation into a company and keep it alive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard because we also have a, a roadmap and dates of delivery of things. Mm -hmm. So we had to organize and structure our um, our teams. So we create a multidisciplinary feature team. So we have uh, five feature teams and they're multidisciplinary with PMs, product people, UI people, business people, mm -hmm. and developers. And we have them innovate within these features 30% of their time, 30% mm. of the time hitting the roadmap and 30% of the time debugging. So, so that way every, every team has autonomous innovation time. So instead of creating uh, innovation days like we used to or doing what um, uh, Google, Google did, yeah. we just build it right into our workflow. Mm -hmm. So what was one of those times you said that someone was surprised because they innovated something amazing with the Clara that you saw that took the shackles off and they were really amazed by? There were, um, there were three things that have that have been surfacing. One of them was um, my CTO was building our analytics platform and then one day he just went, oh, I'm going to create a newspaper out of everybody's data. And he did. And it was amazing. So the first implementation of it is in the product today. In the next few weeks, something called the naked brain is going to show up in it. So That's a good name. I like that, yeah. You'll love it. But... Uh, <laughs> After a few iterations of tuning the recommendation engine and then being able to uh, surface videos in it, he's going to create it so that you can click on someone's name and then go see their recommendations because that's how we can anything that is un, that is you know listed, mm. you can unlist or make things private. But uh, anything that's public. Then you'll be able to, if somebody's a physicist, you'll be able to go, I want to see what a physicist's recommendation is. Yeah. And so it's sort of an interesting way to be mentored by somebody in Indirectly. The yeah. 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 So, uh, and then the other thing is something called Journeys that's coming. Mm -hmm. So Journeys is uh, on its way. And what I like about that is um, if, if, like people follow some of my things on nanotechnology yeah. and there's a little bit of a learning journey that happens with basic technology and showing and building it and taking it to the uh, audacious side of nanotechnology. And if somebody joins my journey, they can choose to join that and they can see all the ontologies in which I'm taking people on this learning journey. Mm -hmm. And then they can, if I stop, they can take it over and other people can choose to join that journey. Um, so what we're trying to do is make, make learning really transparent. So we, we become a community that we learn from. Um, and then the, the third thing is where I was working on trying to visualize the cognitive graph for people and making it understandable. So it's really hard to take complex algorithms and um, the way things are constantly moving. So our cognitive graph is basically looking at yeah. the context in which you're trying to learn things yeah. and being able to do that context shift. And Yeah, I was going to ask a question about that because... I was reading up on this and from what I understand, when you search in Google, you get these lists, right? And then when I was reading about Declara, the, the technology platform you call the cognitive graph and it's different from the yeah. list, right? Yeah. So when you go into the newspaper, it, we're leveraging predictive analytics on all of your behaviors. That's why there's a variety of content in there and um, because it's looking at uh, everything that you're doing, mm -hmm. and because we're complex people, we we have people have collections on uh, food. It's like everybody has a food collection. I have a paleo diet one because I'm constantly trying to stay fit. But 
Um, and then there's, uh, you know, all of my neurosciences. And then I want to go to Greece someday. <laughs> so I have a collection on Mykonos and, you know, all of these different things. Right. But it doesn't mean that I am one thing. It's humans have different interests and they're constantly trying to learn different things. Right. So grabbing all of that and being able to create the serendipity mm -hmm. in the the research or the cert, the um, newspapers, what we've done in personalizing it, then when you do a search in our site, we really bring in a faceted search so that you can either get the videos or the insights or people's collections or so the search really focuses in on that and that'll constantly get better and better and better and that also tunes the newspaper and other things and helps connect you to different people yeah. but what's um, what was really hard is how do you visualize so I wanted to visualize people's cognitive graph for them yes. that so, is really hard <laughs> yeah it's sort of like I don't want to look at my naked brain no um, <laughs> yeah. but you want to have an insight so we yeah. we did put it in right away because we wanted to see how people use the product yeah. and generated some data and um, then we're going to start out on hey here's here's here are here's a T version, um, sort of your depth of engagement and breadth of influence as your ROI around reading. How are you impacting your community mm -hmm. or the community writ large? And uh, after that, we'll uh, bring in the curators side of you, so so that you can see how you're impacting people in who read and are interacting with your content mm -hmm. and so that you can see um, how important you are into the community of learning. That is it's kind of a scary powerful. thing, actually. Yeah, I mean, it's super powerful, but we wanted to really figure out how to visualize this first so that it incents you to, you know, be excited. But it also is an important piece because um, we have enterprise products in um, – um, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Australia, and in Genentech here. And if somebody quits their job, they should be able to take their digital certificate of how they've impacted their organization with them to their next job. Mm -hmm. And imagine being able to go, this is how I'm impacting, this is my ROI I get to carry everywhere, which is much more powerful than what LinkedIn's endorsements are. So in LinkedIn, you have your CV, which is very powerful. But now imagine having your, your uh, knowledge profile that you can take mm -hmm. everywhere with you yeah. as, as your proof of, of your impact. Yeah. Um, what's powerful about that are, you know, designers and artists have their portfolio, but um, knowledge workers don't get to take their learning perf portfolio right. or knowledge right. portfolio with them. So... So that's going to be coming out, and uh, we'll also have groups so that um, what I'm finding is I'm, I have um, people that are working on next generation games, next generation innovations in neuroscience, mm -hmm. and they really want, and these guys are MIT and Stanford and UTS, University Technology, Sydney, all kind of collaborating on our platform. Now they want to have all these tools in a private space so that they can create new content and then publish it out into the community. So that's exciting, and we'll be able to let them do that, and people can go in and create groups within their organizations as well. Yeah, yeah. That learn. I could see that how that learning footprint that you can take with you would be powerful um, everywhere you go. And you know, when you're talking about this stuff, it's no one's created this, these algorithms and this artificial intelligence in this type of platform, um, like a, you know, the cognitive graph. How do you push forward when it's, you're going into uncharted waters and no one's done this before and it doesn't have a name, you know? Yes, yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's, you know, it. uh, that's why when we started the company, we started in the enterprise space to show the power of what we were doing yeah. in a in a controlled way but then our core values are around do the um, you know do the impossible mm -hmm. 
which doesn't mean stay up all night and do that. It means actually innovate in the edges and mm -hmm. helping to push all of us forward. Um, be passionate and be true. And what I was able to raise uh, good money in our A round, but then I went to my investors and said, I want to do something bigger than than LinkedIn. I want to do something really big, and that means going back to our core values and being true because we, our vision is change how the world learns, mm -hmm. and that meant mm -hmm. that we had to create the consumer side of the product, and most investors would have walked away from us for doing that. So. I'm super grateful to uh, mm -hmm. GSV, Mark Flynn's our lead investor, um, Data Collective, Matt Ocko uh, is our lead investor, EDB from uh, EDBI Singapore, fabulous investor, uh, and they're transforming their entire country, so that's it's amazing, and then SUSA Ventures has been an incredible partner, so we feel super fortunate and lucky to have people who are in it for the long run yeah because which is tougher you know, yeah yeah because now in silicon valley it's become too common for investment to just happen in apps that they then flip into facebook or twitter or linkedin or google instead of building a new platform and it's time look google's been a search platform for 25 years yeah. and all these tools are now older and it's time for the next generation of platforms to come out and and to really take people uh, into the into the future. Yeah. So hey, Ramona, when you talk about this stuff, I like guess you know, you can and, and other people can see a million different applications on and offline. How do you decide what you're gonna focus it on in the beginning? Yeah, you know, and that's the thing. Everybody when it was fascinating because people were like pick a vertical and get start focusing on there and I right. kept going you know there are too many platforms that are vertical specific that's great for the enterprise but in the space we're in um, and with how complex pe people are if we're really going to show the power of um, these algorithms we have to build the ubiquity of these algorithms to be able to uh, or create this ubiquitous space of knowledge and innovation. And that's what I consider Declare. It's sort of your ubiquitous knowledge and innovation platform. Mm -hmm. So if you're innovating on something, those algorithms should be mm. able to come and help you while helping other people in other areas. But that's, that's truly the future. I see what you mean. So when let's say I'm innovating on health, so I'd go on to Clara and it would kind of incorporate a, the cognitive graph and give me different things and create different connections that maybe I didn't think of because of the algorithms in Declara. Type yeah, of. imagine the power, and this has happened. Imagine the power of being able to surface people and content from around the world. Like you know, we have these guys that aren't even geographically are in the same time zone and yet they're collaborating together even before we have groups they're they're co-curators in the content and they've been able to find each other and um they wouldn't have been able to otherwise and so it's it's interesting because we're creating this um this ability to surface this expertise and it may not be the same expertise but but complementary expertise so that you can innovate faster, actually. So, you know, like if I were, um, it's funny because a doctor, I was at a presentation at GSV and a doctor approached me and he said, what the power of this is, is being able to, if you're creating a new drug, to be able to bring in universities from around the world to who have expertise in different aspects of the molecules mm -hmm. to come together and actually solve the problem as a community instead of as separate competitive components. Right, right, right. 
How is Australia? I know Australia uses it heavily in the education system there, right? What? How are yes. they using it currently? You know, they use it. Um, they're using our enterprise tool, and the way they use it different than uh, Mexico. So, because of course, geopolitically, the countries had different uh, goals, but um, all the educators in in uh, Australia wanted to be able to help the country align their new curriculum standards and professional learning standards mm -hmm. to uh, their their transform transformation. So as a country, a lot of their agribusiness has been decimated by global warming and um, they adapted, adopted the Asian standards. So how do you adopt the Asian standards and try to create a new workforce that competes and the knowledge economy and um, so their competitors and their employers are now going to be in Singapore and China and Korea and so uh, it meant that the educators really had to transform their own um, professional work it's uh, it's astounding and they didn't have very much time and they, they've they had years of uh, content in five different content stores that they needed to be able to surface and get realigned. So they decided, well, the best way to do this instead of hitting them on the head with a hammer is to actually incorporate them in crowdsourcing and rapidly realigning all of their content um, to these new standards. So it saved them billions of dollars to be able to do that instead of buying new content from the publishers oh, no. and the other powerful thing was by doing that the educators created learning communities like 700 some odd learning communities and helped each other uh, on board to the new curriculum standards and create new content for their classrooms so really powerful and our machine learning went in and auto tagged all of their digital content so that they didn't have to manually do, do that Wow. And I want to talk more in detail about Declare, but I also want to find out some of the pathway of how it, it got there, how you got there. And I want to go back to when the, I think the Marines showed up in, in your college dorm, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, way back when I, um, you know, I was such a, an, uh, a uh, hyperactive person, so... I've always had to run, like even before I come to work, I have to work out, otherwise I can't sit and pay attention. So, you need to fatigue yourself to, to exhaustion <laughs> so you can sit there. I've got to be absolutely exhausted and it's good for the brain, helps uh, steer off Alzheimer's, yeah. but, um, but it also allows me to feel uh, you know, relax while I'm at work and not sit there going, I really need to leave this meeting and go for a run. But uh, when I was in class, I used to make people nuts that way. So um, fidgeting, I actually tackled the teacher once. What do you mean? <laughs> oh, it's just being a kid, you know, before my frontal lobe was myelinated, I had a hard time with my impulse control. But you know, I thought, well, why don't we play, uh, you know, um, hide and go seek? And anyway, my teacher had left to go do something, um, you know, take some papers to the principal. And a friend of mine went to the bathroom and then came back in. And everybody in the class was thinking that I, I stood up on a desk and then I jumped on the first person who came in the door. Oh, my, my friend. But anyway, I was a horrible kid. Um, <laughs> That's pretty funny, Ramona. I don't, I don't know why kids do these things. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, so when I joined the Marine Corps, I was just thinking, I hope these people make me run. <laughs> so Usually people yeah. go there and probably say the opposite. They're like, I hope I don't have to run that much. And you're saying, I hope they make me run. <laughs> Yeah, and they didn't make me run enough. But I ended up being uh, the most physically fit Marine, the Leatherneck of the Year Award. But And that was because I, I ran all the time, too. So they went to kick me out. But um, I read that, yeah, like every day after work, you would run 13 miles. Uh, yes. And if I had legs, I'd still be doing that. But I, uh, I mean, I have legs, but I mean, 
my knees not are, titanium all different yeah, parts yeah every time i try to um you know get back into long distance running or anything so i break it's ironic that all the titanium just isn't how's the titanium uh, breaking you must be like just excessively <laughs> overexerting yourself if you're breaking titanium. Well, it's in the foot that it, it doesn't do so well. My knee, I have a left knee, and funniest story, I decided to do mountain ring, and um, the mountain I was on was icy, and I slipped, and my mm. titanium knee got caught in front of me, my foot behind me, so I was sliding down the hill, and there was a big boulder, and ever, all my friends were like, well, she's going to slide off the cliff oh. and hit the boulder with my knee. And then when I um, you know, was sitting there, I was like, wow, that hurt like crazy, and I had all this blood coming out. So everybody thought I broke my leg, but I just cut the skin. Oh. And uh, I just had my friends straighten out my leg, snap it back into place, and the titanium. Oh, God, that sounds painful. But, you know, it wasn't because titanium doesn't feel anything. Oh, God. Um, so what other strange habits do you have after your work day to get you wound down besides, like, running 13 miles? What, what else do you do? Um, I lift weights. I used to like to rock climb, um, but, you know, my feet now are a problem. But, uh, you know, in a couple of years, the new right foot will settle down and I'll probably get back into rock climbing but I uh you know I I like to keep moving as the yeah. is my biggest thing I love to get up and ride my bike and then lift weights and then um you know do uh extreme hiking or mountain biking yeah. or something because I know you know two things one most people are just super tired and lack energy towards the end of their their work day so i'm wondering from you because you're always doing something what else do you incorporate in your daily activity after work that keeps you energized um i on declare uh, i end up working on uh you know with my teams like i have these people these that now feel like part of my extended family mm -hmm. that i interact with around different types of knowledge areas and they're teaching me things that I've never, like I've never been into virtual reality and then mm -hmm. bringing neuroscience into the virtual world is exciting for me. Very interesting what we can do and, you know, some of the new mesh technologies they're injecting in the brain are pretty exciting. <laughs> so um, learning, I really get, I'll gain a lot of energy from learning and mm -hmm. interacting with people around new concepts and mm -hmm. trying to really push innovation on the edge. So innovating um, is exciting for me. Yeah. And um, so it's funny because the team, I keep going, I need this and this and this in the platform. And one day the product guy said, Ramona, we're not building the platform for you. And he looked at me and he goes, I didn't mean it that way, but <laughs> he's, you know, he's saying the right things that we're building a platform for for the world, not just for my um, desire to read and learn and consume everything. So, uh, but I pretty much have read most of the content on the platform, which is really I I go through the content like crazy. Um, it's it's almost like. Um, when YouTube came out, there was all of the there were all those videos. But then, when uh, when you see the um, effort and the work that people put in into bringing in content and create inciting that content, it is it's fascinating. It's amazing. And yeah, it is very interesting. So you know, like I was saying, at the end of the day, you get energized. You do tons of physical activity, maybe it's running 13 miles, you schedule specific things that are learning experiences that excite you with innovation. And I could see you like a lot of entrepreneurs, when they go to go to sleep, their minds racing. Sleep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Eventually, we, how, so how much sleep do you get? Uh, it depends. I don't get that much sleep. Um, uh, I actually have a collection. I like that answer. Sleep, what are you talking 
<laughs> I know that's like somebody I was at a at a conference I won't tell you which one but somebody who was interviewing me said well how do you manage work life balance I go it's called work there's no life. <laughs> there's no balance life is work and work is life right but I I think that's more and more for most knowledge workers now so um, the time of work and and life are yeah. blended you know you take your cell phone with you your work kind of it's comes everywhere. with you. Yeah, I just hope that for everybody is as excited about their work as I am. But um, so, how much sleep do you get typically? Uh, I I strive for at least four hours, and um, you know, on the weekends I'll I'll get more sleep. But it's hard for me to sleep be yeah. very long. I wake up about I go to bed around uh, one in the morning, and I wake up around three in the morning. Wow! And and then I get on and it's a time for me to be able to read and uh, collect and then I'll get up again around five in the morning and and go work out and uh, you know I try to do all my emails before I get into work and then I come into work a little bit later so what's your before what's your routine before you let's not even call it sleep let's call it a nap before you nap at 1 a.m. what's what's that nighttime routine look like for you um well for instance like last night i left work around 8 30 and then um walked over to the gym and worked out for a few hours and then cooked dinner and did a bunch of emails and did a bunch of collections i sometimes have skype meetings with uh, my team around midnight and uh Uh, Like the other night, I had a Skype meeting with Gartner from 11.30 at night until about 1 in the morning. And then um, then I'll wash dishes and clean and then go go to sleep. And then the dogs need to go to the bathroom, so I take them out and do their thing. Work out again. Do you think it's in your genes that you can do that day in, day out? Or do you think, what do you think? um, Because again, you seem perfectly awake, energized. Do you think you've trained yourself? Do you think it's genetic? What do you think keeps you so energized with so little sleep? Because most, a lot of people probably can't function like that. um, You know, there is research that some people have a gene that allows them to. function well you know mm-hmm. sleep is so good for you you know i i've been researching sleep because it's a conundrum for me yeah i uh, agree it's the same for me that's why i'm asking because i think i get too little sleep and so i figured you have some some research or something that, that i do yeah here i uh, i'll send you to my <laughs> my collections around sleep yeah just I will. go to look it up it's just called sleep in capital letters because you know, at first, it's so frustrating. Like, why can't I sleep? Like, I look over at my partner, who sleeps through, you know, a train wreck. But, <laughs> and then I'm like, God, if, if there's one tiny light or one little noise, I'm wide awake. And then I can't go back to sleep, so I just go back to work. So there's, it is frustrating. And then I finally just gave into it and decided just to, um, decide that it's part of my biological circadian rhythm Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. so I kept thinking it's I've always had sleep problems since I was a kid so I can't blame it on my accident either it's just uh it must be a genetic piece and there's research uh I put an article into my collection on sleep um there is research that some people have a gene where their sleep is highly efficient that when they go to sleep their body detoxes the neurons and resupplies the the brain with uh, all its nutrients, and then off you're running. So, yeah. I'll have to to read up on your your sleep because um, you've somehow hacked it a little bit because you don't seem yeah. dead tired. We should have done this at three a.m. We should have done this uh, this interview at three a.m. Uh, just to yeah. just to have fun with it. Um, so the Marines, I want to know what you learned at the Marines because I was reading also, like at 18 or 19, you were writing algorithms to calculate positions of Russian nuclear silos and guide F-18s, which most 18-year-olds are not doing. Yeah, you know, I'm not allowed to really talk about it. Oh, you about can't it. talk about it. Even better. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, we, um, yeah, there's, there's just, it's just. I guess what did you learn from the Marines or what are some of the big lessons? Discipline. What's that? Yeah. Discipline. Discipline. The opposite of my father. <laughs> he was not disciplined. He was in his own way. But, uh, you know, when it's funny because my older brother said, I wish I had joined the service like you because we needed discipline. So um, there's a rigor in the, the Marine Corps and the rigor is very good for, you know, I, I try to uh, live by certain ethics and um, and have that discipline and how I interact with family or with uh, my personal life and uh, hold to our core beliefs in our company. And I think that those those aspects of the Marine Corps are super important, more than any job, no matter how cool or interesting it is in the service. The, the, the core piece that they give you is... Um, you know, they give, they make sure you have a moral compass and discipline. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even a religious person, but, you know, the whole, the need of really being able to be there for your, your teammates and your colleagues and to sacrifice yourself for others is mm -hmm. really an, an important gift to have. Yeah. And Ramona, we've been referencing, you know, your titanium parts, your broken bones, your surgeries, um, I know talking about that stuff or the story is painful a little bit, but um, could you tell people a little bit about what, what happened? Yeah, so when I got hit by a drunk driver, my left foot got caught up in the wheel well, and um, so a lot of my damage happened to be on my left side, so I um, also suffered from blood chest trauma, mm. and... Um, my mouth had been damaged, which is why I've had to have like a lot of porcelain teeth and uh, implants done and uh, jaw repair. And, um, you know, my tendons and my feet are, have been in ligaments in my feet and the bones were destroyed. Um, and then, you know, as they replaced all these pieces, and it's ironic because one day somebody was just going to go, I'll be in some museum, like the body museum, and they'll go, remember when we used to do this for people, and now we just inject them with stem cells and nanotechnology. So, and it grows uh, back, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, and the, the thing is with um, a lot of the surgeries I've had, um, you know, the impact had been that those parts last for a certain amount of time, and then they have to be replaced again. Right. Unlike your human body parts, if you don't have an accident, they'll live for most of your life fairly well intact. And and so um, probably the best experience I've had is with titanium and not with the bone transplants I've had. So I've had bone transplants and they've had to remove them. Um, they either become necrotic or mm. my body has problems with them or they just don't take and, you know, just disaster after disaster with trying to get harvest bones. And, and it seems weird harvesting bones, but, you know, and it's strange to think that when you're waiting for a new knee or a tibia or an eye, you know, I have a cornea, that you're waiting for someone else to have an accident. Right, so it's you horrible, harvest. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. So the when we move to these new types of technologies, I jump right on them because then you're not you're not hoping some some horrible thing happens to someone else, which is a very weird thing. And you referenced before a big pen. What what happened with the big pen? Um, well, you know, I couldn't. My mouth was filled with gore, and um, you know the they couldn't get my airway open. And so he just took apart a big pin, some guy on the street. And wow. so I have this scar at the base of my neck and he stuck the big pin in there. And now, you know, now I have some lung and lung issues from all of uh, this stuff happening to me, but um, which is why my voice is a little raspy, but um, he saved my life and, um, it was just a random bystander. 
who did that? Yeah. You know, and what we've done is we've partnered with the Red Cross. So we've given them um, a broadcast on our platform. They have all their content on our platform so that they can, if somebody has an emergency or there's a disaster somewhere in the world, instead of going to their box and sending a PDF manual, they can now just send the insights and help save lives faster. We did all that for wow. them for free because I owe them my life. It is amazing. I, I mean, when I read that and when I listen to your story, I can't believe all these bystanders came together and pretty much it sounded like they massaged your heart and like opened up your airway and kept you alive. Yeah, and it's not even just that. It's my entire like my entire life. So of course I've got to build a platform mm -hmm. that helps people uh, transform their lives. Um, you know, I owe the world so much, like these senior citizens who helped yeah. me recover. I, I landed at a senior citizen's home after the hospital because they didn't think I'd survive, so they figured my life was sunsetting. So I'd end up um, with senior citizens and who were sunsetting their lives. But little did they know that their sun setting was giving me a sunrise mm. and they taught me everything and they did it with joy. So it was what like was life a like when you left the hospital and went into the senior citizen home for you? Um, at first it was confusing because I pretty much was not even really thinking I would survive. And um, I thought, okay, they're dumping me here, and this is the end of me. And then, sure enough, the uh, citizens were like grandparents. They were like, get going, and wouldn't let me just get up. So they were the ones that were constantly driving to learn to speak, learn to, to uh, uh, walk, learning to do everything all over again and didn't give me a second to rest or give up on anything. And I think it was through that process where they helped me start looking forward to living and building goals in my life instead of just giving up on my life. And that, that gave me the gunshot I needed to blast off and become the person I've become today. So without them, I wouldn't be here. Yeah, yeah. So when you landed at the old people's home, the senior citizens' home, um, what were you able to walk, or t I mean, what what were you able to do or not do at the time? Um, I had a cast all the way from the tip of my toe up to my hip because mm. I couldn't use that leg, and they didn't know what to do with it. And then, um, you know, imagine trying to, like, they gave me a cane that I didn't know how to use, and then I had two crutches to try to walk around, so I'm like, how do I navigate with a cane? And I was about 60 pounds, so wow. I could barely hold anything, and then they had just opened up the tendons in my hand, so I could barely use that hand. So I was a disaster, so it would have been easier for me to just curl up in a corner and, and just die. Um, but what ended up happening were the senior citizens just kept, um, uh, making sure that they found, they researched and found doctors for me. And, um, you know, I was always on the senior citizen bus going to all the doctor's appointments with the seniors and they'd right. deliver me to these different doctors. And sure enough, you know, just the crowdsourcing <laughs> just worked for me mm. and, some doctor diagnosed me with uh, diabetes insipidus, which changed my health. All of a sudden, I could gain weight once they started medicating me well. And, um, and then I was sent to Wyoming to have me replaced and a bunch of surgeries. And, and then I started being able to walk. And uh, then um, my biggest problem was learn how to be a blind person. Yeah. And from people who didn't know what it was like to be blind. So it was a trial and error experience and a lot of mistakes. So, um, but we persevered as a team and yeah. they heard me through, through all of that. They finally sent me to 
the Braille Institute. So the grant, these senior citizens were like parents to me. Yeah. And, and I thought of them as parents, actually. What is one of your fondest memories from being in the senior citizen home? You know, there are a few. You know, there was a woman who was trying to teach me how to write, and she had been a teacher. She had Alzheimer's. So they'd always sit me next to her, and, you know, it, redundancy in writing is perfect. Oh, so she never remember that she taught me something from before. It was a little frustrating. But then I'd sit next to her, and she'd always ask me at lunch, you know, what she was eating. So I'd have to feel her food, and I'd always go, it's a hamburger. And she'd go, do I like burgers? Every day. So <laughs> it was like Groundhog's Day with her. But... But she was so helpful because she implicitly knew uh, how to write and how to be an educator. And mm. so she was super helpful. It just was frustrating that then the next day it was starting over again. But um, that was one of my fond memories because I, I learned a lot from her. And then um, uh, the men were really funny. They'd always ask me to go bear hunting with them course i hope they were joking so it wasn't the bait but uh right. you know they they just um uh brought humor and taught me gamification in learning that you really need to have a sense of humor and and joy when you're learning especially when you're trying to um have to relearn other things because as an adult even though i was broken up i had an ego you know like I was like I'm an adult I should be able to speak and mm. I don't want to Google gaga in front of people but now I know why kids Google gaga it's practicing you know so you have to practice with sounds and so the guys just made it fun and uh, turned it into something joyful so um, you know I owe them so much I can't even tell you yeah is that normal? They drop someone off at a senior citizen. I've never heard of that before. Yep, but usually. I mean, do they do that? Is that common? Like, if someone's severely injured, they'll they'll do that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Se severely long term patients end up in nursing homes, mm. and then they fade away. I usually. Wow. So, what do you think it was, Ramona, that kept you? Like most people may have curled up in a ball and just given up. I think it was the joy that these people brought to my life and their, you know, I was a stranger and they gave me so much love and um, uh, they inspired me to persevere and um, they invested their time and energy in me and, and uh, that means a lot. And my last company, it's interesting because I had created I partnered with McGraw-Hill and created something called the Power of uh, View. Mm -hmm. And what we had done is taken our algorithms and turned the uh, classroom upside down. So instead of kids adapting to the education system, we had the education system adapt to the kids. Mm. And we changed the schedules. We looked at the preferences in which teachers like to teach either a large classroom environment, project-based learning, small classroom, mentoring, and uh, connected them with the kids that learned best in those conditions and conditions. And when we did that, we took kids that had been behind in math by three years and got them caught up to their age peers wow. in six weeks. The silver bullet wasn't the algorithm. The silver bullet was actually unhooking kids from feeling like they were not able to learn and helping them see themselves as somebody something different. Mm -hmm. And um, that was inspired by these senior citizens. When they saw me not as a disabled person, but as a person who had potential and was going to blossom, it help me see myself as a productive human being and it it drove me to feel like I needed to get on my path and get going yeah and you know what in even a 10 hour talk we wouldn't do your story justice with what happened so I, I really encourage people to watch the TED talk about I mean you were in a coma for I think 18 months um, you were blind you were blind essentially for 10 years because of what happened and, and numerous other things. 
So this, what we talked about, just kind of touches a tip, tip, tip of the of the iceberg. Um, so people should watch that. Um, so after all of this, you then competed in the Paralympics. Yeah, I I competed in um, not even in the Paralympics. I competed in the Masters International Racing with sighted people. So, oh wow! And, yeah. It's crazy, right? So, so you go from if, not walking, 60 yeah. pounds, not being able to see, not being able to speak, to to what? Well, I'm kind of the modern day Forrest Gump. But uh, <laughs> the, the, what happened was um, I was in Durango and bikes, you know, these professional cyclists were there um, and, uh, you know, they – some of the college students at uh, Fort Lewis College were like, hey, let's take the blind girl for a bike ride. So, sounds like an, a, a good idea. Not really a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the local bike shop had a tandem and they sized me on it. Mm. And these guys, um, you know, uh, put me on a bike and started racing around and riding in the front. So the first thing first day was horrific because I hadn't bent that leg in years and so um, the best way to rehab is to not, not know that someone's about to pedal and they just snap you right oh, into uh, movement so that was my first experience with uh, true agonizing pain but I'm surprised I, you got back on the bike what, what happened next <laughs> You know what inspired me to get back on the bike was it was years I hadn't felt the wind in my face. Mm. So all of a sudden I was like, there's this pleasure pain thing going on, S and M. Anyway, there's <laughs> this this pleasure that was coming from the pain in a weird way, but it, it was the reward for tolerating that and I would it I can't believe how much pain I endured. And even when I was racing, I had incredible pain because they hadn't fixed that knee the right way for a long time. Um, but the uh, the reward was this feeling of freedom um, because when you're blind, you're either holding someone's arm or yeah. you're you have a guide dog or you always have a cane. Right. And to be on the back of the tandem was truly this... I could imagine, pretend like I was by myself, except for the person in front so always yelling at you. So um, I had the good pleasure when I went to Europe to race to have, uh, you know, a great group of uh, master racers. Um, like uh, Glenn Winkle won six uh, World Cups, and he wow. he um, captained the front of the bike for my World Championships in the World Cup in Austria, and so uh, we won that. And then uh, Vera Bean was my coach and mentor to help me do that, and she had won all the, these U.S. national races. And so I, I, when I started out, all these guys would just take out riding, and then the guy that was the head of the bike shop, I don't remember his name, but he called up a friend of his who ran the um, – uh, USCF, the United States Federation for Cycling, and said, hey, there's this crazy blind girl. Do you have anybody who take her into any of these races? And so they found uh, different professional riders who would ride in the front and captain, and uh, I raced, and we got a silver at the Nationals. Wow. And so then I was invited to do be part of the international team and that was great. It was truly uh, a different experience for me and inspirational as well. That's amazing, Ramona. You know, we take so much for granted, you know, and what was it like when you first started to get your sight back? You know, it was it was actually harder for me and Why? people are usually astounded. So I, yeah. I actually had declined having... Um, the surgery for a few years um, and I did that because I could not imagine my life without my guide dog Annie mm. so Annie was like my it would be giving up a guide dog is like cutting off your arm because 
you have this dog that looks out for everything for you, finds cracks and stops for that, looks for tree branches, stops for those. And so uh, when I said, you know, I'm comfortable being blind and I can't give up my dog, people thought I was nuts. But I had truly become comfortable. And so I had a community and friends. I was racing bikes. I had a lot of joy in my life except for all these surgeries that I kept having to have all the time. But mm. um, anyway, Annie got sick, so I mm. opted in for the surgery. But it's not like in the movies where you wake up and right. you have this vision. <laughs> Actually, what happens is you wake up, and since I was blind for so long, I had lost a lot of the trace memories of what things look like. So I... I think they call it associative blindness. Like I would see. You see like a blob I, of something? Or what do you well, see? I would see you, but I'd go, what is that? Like, you know, like it, commonsensically you'd say human being or chair or whatever, but everything felt mm -hmm. weird and I didn't have a name for it. So I'd have to touch it. And then as soon as I touch it, I'd start putting a name to it. So you can imagine as I'm touching people and things, people probably thought I would look nuts. But um, but it was the only way for me to really relearn things. And, and I still struggle with colors uh, because it's like I still have a little bit of a, uh, like a, a light curtain that's across the eye. So it's hard to when things don't stand out, like yellow. The funny story is my partner, back before Google Maps, um, she wanted me to go someplace, so she highlighted on a map where I should go with a yellow highlighter, and we had this fight over it. She, I go, you didn't give me the directions. I got gotcha. you. And, and I'm like, and she's yelling at me, it's, all, it's right there in front of you, you know, and so it's just... You know, these moments, these little aha moments that, right. oh, I'm not seeing the world the way other people see the world. Yeah. Funny. And I couldn't tell, you know, there's one of a, a fun story that you have of when you first learned to walk. And I couldn't tell when you talk about it, if you're kidding or not kidding, when the, old, the elderly people were teaching you to walk with the cane across the street. Is oh, yeah. No, I'm not kidding. Yeah. So, um you know, I had a little bit of PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder. I would have that. Anyone would have that if that, you know, happened to them. Yeah. Yeah. And now you have a cane, you know, a white cane. And, you know, you hope that drivers, when they see that cane, they go, oh, blind person, that blind person might walk erratically, so don't run them over. But, you know, people being people don't pay attention to the environment and in fact, they may drive towards you if you're looking weird enough because they're attracted to just, it's a science that they actually have around that, why drivers run over people. Anyway, um, I was uh, trying to cross the street and, or learn to cross the street, and this uh, woman basically said, you know, just stick your cane out there, and if a car hits the cane, don't cross the street. So <laughs> That's the worst idea I've ever heard. First idea, like it bruised my hand and the cane's flying all over. And so finally, Kremlin had actually put a, a crossing zone, you know, a ball crossing zone up there. So, but imagine closing your eyes when you come to a corner mm. and then trying to hear the traffic and trying to hear that the traffic's going in different directions and then trying to pick the time to cross the street. And how do you know where straight is? So everybody's like, just go straight. And you're like, yeah, right. If you see. have a reference point. Right. So, yeah. So there's no reference point when you're trying to cross. So that's, I, like, I couldn't tell if you're just being funny or that you're being serious that you just stuck the cane out and like cars were hitting the cane. <laughs> I did. <laughs> it's crazy. That's why very quickly I ended up with a seeing eye dog. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, it's also stressful. So, like, the first time I tried to cross the street with a seeing eye dog, I was trying to control the dog so it wouldn't get hit mm. by, you know, I, and then finally they were like, if you can't trust the dog, you can't have the dog. Mm. So I had to 
just let go and let the dog take the lead. And then, you know, the amazing thing about a guide dog is if you step off or if you both make a mistake, that dog's going to push you out of the way and take the car. Wow. So um, I don't know how they can train a dog to do that. But uh, basically they're just like, don't fight the dog because you'll both live if it can push you out of the way and get out of the way That's at the amazing. same time. So amazing, uh, amazing experience. Ramona, how'd you get then from there to synaptic mash? That is a lot. I mean, we need another hour or two. <laughs> or just fast forward to synaptic mash. Yeah. So essentially I, um, I finished up with college. I ended up, uh, going to, you know, I did all of these races, finished up with college and then decided I'd go to New York, um, after I had surgery and because I thought I need to start my life all over again. And I figured what's the most complex city you can go to. <laughs> Let me make this the hardest as possible for myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All my friends said I'd starve to death <laughs> because I didn't know how to ask for food the way a New Yorker would. But anyway, I ended up there and um, I went to the new school for social and political research. And that was after I actually was working at um, Camarillo State Hospital, mental hospital with acute schizophrenics because wow. I was interested and that's a whole story especially oh, I'm sure you have some crazy stories from that oh incredible stories from that um really funny ones too what's your but, favorite one from the acute schizophrenic days uh there are it's a good well, chapter in your book by the way whatever whenever your uh, your main book comes out there has to be like acute schizophrenic days as a chapter so go on yeah. Yeah, so I went there to uh, basically do um, my residency. So I went there, and um, my best friend was there as well, as not as a patient, but um, as a candidate to be a doctor. Yeah. Anyway, she um, she and I showed up there, and we were uh, I was on the acute schizophrenic unit, and we would get these keys like. They were a key to let people in, and then they'd give you these um, emergency things. So if you pull on the string, all the lights and alarms in the place go off if if you're attacked. Like dangerous situation, yeah. Yeah, because some of the schizophrenics had eaten people and done other things. They eaten people. <laughs> they had a. They were locked up for violent crimes. Wow, so, crazy. So anyway. Um, some of them, some of them with the eating disorders or there were a malay of, you know, just an, an array of different things right. going on. Right. So, um, so you had those and my, I had a guide dog at the time, Annie, she, she went there with me and I was blind. So at first everybody was afraid, blind girls running around with these folks and then what's the dog going to do? So, um, one time I was talking to a, a patient and she was holding a canister of milk and then she fell on the ground. I have no idea why. So then I decided to just lay on the ground and because she continued to talk as if she was standing up. Oh my God. So I laid on the ground She and then she went, are you okay? You just fell. And I was like, no, I, you fell. But then she was like, no, I, I haven't fallen. But it was like she couldn't. She didn't realize That's that, so and then, and then she was like, "You know, we, we've all talked about you here, and we feel so sorry for you being blind." And I was like, "That is so ironic, given the fact that I can leave at any time, but yet in the empathy that mm. the folks there had yeah. had for me, even though some of them were in there for violent crimes and they weren't able to empathize with their victims." They had empathy, empathy. empathy. Yeah. right? Because they said that they couldn't imagine anything worse than not being able to see. Wow! So it's all around context or Jeez. person's yeah. perspective, right? So yeah. that was an interesting story. And then the other funny story was, um, my friend. I won't give you her name, but anyway, she was opening up 
one of the doors and one of the patients just pushed her over and went running out and took off and went running down the street. They and escaped, essentially. Escaped. And she was freaked out. She came to me and she goes, oh, great. You know, my first week here, <laughs> I've lost a patient. And I'm like, I can't help you find it. <laughs> And then she's like, can Annie, you know, be the sniffer dog? Oh, and God. one of the dogs came up and said, don't worry about it. When lunch comes, he'll come running back because they don't know <laughs> what to do with the lunch. So apparently they ran all the time and came back. But there were a million stories wow. that, that were funny. And one time I did take a fall and the key left my hand. And then several of the patients started chanting the one key, one key, because it's the key to get out. And I'm like, great. So I pull on the cord to go get help. And of course, there's no batteries in the stupid thing. Oh, so. gosh. But Annie protected the key, and uh, I was able to. I can it. only picture what this chanting and that happening. That... <laughs> <laughs> it was a little like one who flew over the cuckoo's nest, but. So, so synaptic mash. You're at so you start synaptic mash. Yes. What's your I, vision for that at the time? So I ended up. Um, uh, I fell in love with education, and it was an accident. Actually, I was working at the VA, and um, I decided to go visit a school in South San Francisco to see what people were doing for assessing because I was trying to build neuro assessments to quickly assess kid, uh, kids who were wounded. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I realized, oh my God, the school looks like when I went to school. Are you kidding me? So then I went, we've got to figure out how to get resources into the hands of teachers that aren't antiquated. Yeah. So, so then I got, went on this quest. I actually got my master's in education so I could speak the language of a teacher and not mm. as a neuroscientist and um, took a fellowship and moved up to Seattle, started working in the school district. I built a, a big data, social data learning network, you know, about the same time that Facebook came out and the kids named it the source. So it became the source of all their data mm. and, and social networking in the school district. And then... Um, I, I decided to leave and started a company called Synaptic Mash, and I wanted to bring the cognitive and neurosciences into education so right. that we could help modernize things. But at that time, I had built uh, everything in the cloud, and at that time, you know, school districts were all about put the server behind, you know, our in our server wall. So, and nobody was talking about the cloud. So I was a little bit out on out in front by about three years, which is a hard place to be as a startup because it's hard to get funding when people are like, what's a cloud? <laughs> right. So, they don't have a name for it even. Yeah. No. So, uh, anyway. What was the biggest challenges with uh, Synaptic Mesh? Um, getting people to trust the cloud. Hmm. That even though you're putting data in the cloud, nobody can access it. It's locked down. It's secure. Hmm. Probably more secure than um, than when you have it in a server because this way you can um, you can protect the data in ways that somebody can't be you know in the school district so if a server goes down in the school district it could stay down for weeks or months but when you have um, you know an SLA as a business you're going to make sure those servers stay up or you don't get paid. So there's an incentive to protect the data and keep that data highly accessible when you're, when you're a cloud technology. So I created, um, I was early to creating SaaS technologies for education. So what was Synaptic Mesh like at the height, at its height? Like what it looked like as far as uh, what staff that you had to hire and infrastructure and what the product was yeah I mean it was a pretty amazing tool imagine being able to to like if if a school district brought it in and like the IT services at Seattle school had uh, 120 technologists now imagine if you brought in synaptic mesh you could probably reduce all of that down to 20 people 
the savings because we took care of all the operational back-end systems, all the data warehousing, mm -hmm. all the automation within grading and um, assessing and getting data to the parents, the school, the kids, and um, all in, you know, like a one-stop shop and very inexpensively. So we could roll up all the data from every every kid all the way from every classroom up to the district, up to the state, and up nationally if you wanted to. So the product was used across the state of Indiana. We were in eight districts there, and then it continued to grow. Um, we were in several districts in Colorado and Seattle. Um, and then when Promethean bought us, we rolled out globally, so all over Mexico and um, uh, Europe, England. Um, now it's the data backend for all of the whiteboard technologies and those clicker technologies. What was so, it like selling your uh, baby? I mean, because I think it was nine years old or ten years old, right, when you... No, it was only three years oh, old. Oh, it was three years old. Okay. Yeah, we we had built things very quickly. And, um, you know, when we sold it, um, you know, I became the chief science officer for uh, Promethean. It was interesting because I was coming up with ways of what if we could look at the process of learning by taking all the whiteboard technologies and the iPads and bringing... Um, uh, and it was before the iPads. They kind of had their own version of the iPad. Mm -hmm. But um, if you could could look at as a teacher is writing on the whiteboard and actually see where uh, a functional error was made and be able to correct that on the fly. Because what I noticed when I was looking at how kids would copy what they see the teachers doing, the teacher made a mistake. Some of the kids who didn't have the foundational learning would copy that error and it would be built into their processes forever. And other kids who understood fundamentally what they were doing would just ignore the teachers. So they sort of had the gestalt and just self-corrected. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was interesting because I thought if we could understand the process of learning, we could actually stop some of the fundamental errors from being transferred to the students and yeah. auto-correct that and on the fly give professional development to teachers. So I came up with this concept called the Mobius Strip where all we look at all the student data and associate teacher professional development to all that student data so you'd help the educator always stay ahead of their students' learning needs. So I could see this, you know, you just have this life mission for learning, you know, all along the way. So I don't know, you may say you didn't, but um, celebrate, but what did you, after the sale, after you create this company from nothing, what do you do after the sale to celebrate or enjoy a moment just to step, you know, step back for a second? It's weird, but I didn't. <laughs> I knew, see. I, I somehow knew you were going to say that. Yeah. You <laughs> nothing. Know, I, nothing. I went right into work and tried to help uh, Promethean become successful. And then, um, and then I had this aha moment and I thought, I want to create a, uh, an algorithm that becomes your concierge service on your iPhone. And, and then I realized, well, that's helpful, but what if you can take that and build a platform that's much much more um, bigger and be able to bring ubiquitous learning to the mm -hmm. world. So, so then Declare was born mentally and then as soon as my um, uh, last contracted day came up at Promethean at midnight, I quit. <laughs> you know, one I of the biggest things, to give people the extent in the backing behind Declare, uh, not just from a technology perspective, but a financial perspective. I mean, you have, like you were mentioning before, some amazing um, people have put money into the company, Peter Thiel's foundation. Um, what was the process of raising funds like? And I don't know if you can, I think it's public about talking about how much was actually raised. Um, this is a huge project. 
Yeah, it's a huge product in um we had for our A round we had an unprecedented uh round we about thirty two point five million dollars. Huge and yeah. Huge. And because what we're doing isn't a small thing, it's a huge thing. Yeah. And um and so yeah, it it was hard, especially uh in the early days and you know, to get people to see what we were trying to do and when we had early successes in these big countries, like startups tend to go, Okay, let me do something in a classroom or let me do something with An experiment. These. And I'm like, Oh, let's just load forty thousand people on and then, you know, one point six million people on. But from Synaptic Mesh I learned how to scale up a a platform and um uh you know, we have incredible people working here. So my chief operating officer had been the CTO for the National Basketball Association, the CIO for E-Trade, and then C uh, CVP, or Corporate Vice President for Microsoft, and built all the data centers in the world. And There's some serious chops. Oh, yeah. So I'm like, oh, we got this. So, <laughs> so then... Um, so then we realized, okay, let's take everything. Once we had these successes, I talked to the former formal um, investment uh, companies, um, you know, Peter Thiel, Data Collective, SUSE, and GSV, and they put in money. And um, then we went to town and um, put our heads down and you know, win as fast as possible to build out the consumer side of things. So the power will be, imagine being able to take your your knowledge, like your digital certificate of everything, the quantification of your knowledge, and being able to take that from job to job and out into the community. And it represents basically your ROI or your impact that you're having on an organization the open community or even groups that you're working with, yeah. how powerful that is as a knowledge worker. Yeah. Amazing. So what what should people know about Declara or a story from Declara days so far that would be interesting? Yeah, you know, so, um, yeah, there's so many interest like my story, so many interesting stories, but... Um, you know, it, being in a startup is a little bit like being on a roller coaster ride. You have your up days, your down days, and um, probably have post traumatic stress from being a, a startup CEO because every day is a different experience. But um, you know, we when we um, decided to extend out and have a consumer product, you could imagine. You know, your investors and your board look at you and they're like, but you're so successful doing the enterprise. Why would you take this on? And and it's at those times where you have to really take a very deep look on your core values and take the risk. Like I could keep doing what we were doing. But over the next five years, the world's going to fundamentally change. And if we didn't take the lead in building out the consumer product and bring ubiquitous learning to the world and really innovate into this space. So Facebook owns the social graph, LinkedIn, the professional graph. Well, we want to own the, the knowledge graph. Hmm. And knowledge workers are growing uh, faster and faster worldwide, but they have nothing that represents quantitatively what they understand and that they own to be able to take with them and so we really wanted to provide that and to provide ubiquitous learning so that we can solve big real world problems and be that uh, your secret weapon in your hip pocket wherever you go yeah Ramon and I've heard you say something like that about even in your accident days sometimes the CEO feels like the darkest days yeah. What what's been the toughest part about being CEO? I think um, the toughest part is that you have to put the company ahead of everything. Like uh, you know, when you are making decisions around personnel and 
like for instance, um, when you get a certain amount of money, you have to make that money last for a long time. You don't want to be frivolous with it because this is hard-earned money that, that people have invested in you. Right. So you have you have to protect it and make it last. But there are these decisions that you make that to go fast, you're going to have certain numbers of people. And then as I automate things, it's like the brain. When you're learning a new language, your brain incorporates um, the language area, makes it takes over different areas of the brain, and then it becomes efficient and condenses. So as a company uh, automates things, like we automate at QA, well, I don't need to have a bunch of quality assurance people anymore. And even though I love these people, I had to uh, go down in efficiencies and let yeah. those folks go because we have automated the tools. Yeah. So. Are people scared they're going to eliminate themselves? Like they're going to create this algorithm that's going to eliminate their own job, essentially. That's uh, what's happening across the United States, yeah, right? Yeah. So like when you think about what happened in the, the car industry, basically you have robots that don't want benefits, don't need pay, don't... Show up on every day to work. Uh, yeah. They work 24-7 and have a little bit of maintenance. And, so what scares me, you know, like I'll hear schools say, hey, let's start teaching kids to code. Well, that's great, except for ultimately we'll automate that. So we need to start teaching people those higher order cognitive skills so that they can be able to command those codes and architect the software and do the things that automation will never be able to eliminate. Yeah. The more creative, imaginative, innovative aspects of a, a knowledge worker's job. Yeah. Any other tough, tough points that people, other CEOs or people running a company should think about from your experience? I think the, the number one job of a CEO is fundraising all the time. And, um, you know, and I think that it's tough because the because what you're doing is you're trying to create a vision for investors about something in the future that is intangible to them right and them to believe that that is the future and that you're going to solve that problem and that's yeah. an important problem and you'll be able to monetize that right that is super hard and you'll hear a thousand no's before you even hear one yes mm -hmm. because it's going to be that one person who can actually mentally image what that is going to be like for instance I'm sure when um, so the Google guys um, their their name used to be I forgot backbone or something like that but it was a different name and when they were trying to say look we can index everything and you know it took them years to get to there and how do you tell people yeah people are gonna search yeah right they weren't and, even using the internet yeah Right, so it's there. There is this, um, and what they solved first was the library pro problem at Stanford. So searching across the library. So there's on an internet. So there's this. Um, how do you help people see that? And I have mentored lots of small startups, and they're in our office all the time, asking that same question: How do you communicate? what my um, platform's doing or what my technology or my innovation is yeah. and it funded. <coughs> and so many companies go out of business between inception and trying to do that first raise. Yeah, yeah. I could see how that's very tough and I could see how it's easier, maybe not the second time around when you've proven yourself, when you have all these amazing team members I don't know if it actually is easier. It may be just as hard. Um, what was it like when you first did it, when you didn't have a proven company that you started and sold and and had all, and actually learned, like you said, scaling and everything else? Yeah, you know, it was, I made a lot of mistakes. One of the mistakes that I did was micromanagement. So I had an employee who came up to me and 
and she basically said, why'd you hire anybody if you can do everything in the company yourself? Mm. And then That's I a went, jab. Yeah. Yeah, I went, oh, okay, I need to learn how to take my hands off the keyboard and let other people do their jobs. Mm -hmm. And then, so when I started Synaptic Mash, I really, you know, I have to catch myself so much because I can see what, what I want the product to do. But you have to trust people, and then when they make mistakes, you have to realign them or you have to let them go. But um, you hire leaders for a reason, and you have to help guide them to be successful leaders. And I learned something else from one of my employees here, and we, we were hiring people, and we would take so much time, and we were always hiring with perfection. And never firing or anything. And um, what what this person said to me was, "You're not taking enough risks mm. until until you've fired people or have done riffs. You haven't taken enough risks on people and brought them in to get that knowledge that you would otherwise have found. That person who thinks different than you or codes different or um, builds the data yeah. sciences different and you know, there's a lot of risk mm. in that. You know, you're bringing in people and they're taking risks. Yeah. And so you'll try on things and then something will stick. And we acquired a company and it was the best thing we did. But everybody in the company was like, don't acquire, you know, like the, the uh, leadership, don't acquire that company. And the moment we brought that team in and it was mm. like we stepped on the accelerator wow. and... Um, it brought new inspiration, new ways to look at the same problems, and uh, helped us become a much better company. Yeah. So sometimes you have to take those risks, yeah. and you have to know in your heart you're right, and you have to know in your heart when no one else can see it how to find those key people in your company who can help you build your vision yeah. and build it better than you. Because... The moment that I was able to bring in people I trusted, they started innovating on top of my innovation, making it better than me. Yeah. Ramona, this has been truly amazing. I want to thank you so much for your time. And where can we, we'll point people towards Declara. What should people do once they're on there? Um, get on Declara, search for me and get on, uh, follow me and get into my collections and start creating collections because what happens is as you're collecting and insighting, you're actually, as you're learning, you're teaching others and it's truly magical. So uh, we all learn when you learn and I feel really honored to be on this. Thank you so yeah. much. Mona, it's been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. I can't wait to watch the... Uh, movie that comes out about you at some day. Is there an actual someone coming out with a movie or, or writing a script? Yeah. For? Yep, actually, um, you know, uh, Sting's wife is a producer and she has a great team um, that they put together. Uh, one of, I guess, one of the directors from um, uh, the first Twilight are coming together to to do a movie, and we're negotiating certain things right now, but. Uh, you know, looks you know. like it's a go, and that's amazing. Know. It's one of those things. I think I'll, you know, people watch it, and it'll say based on a true story, and all of it will be true. But people won't they'll think, oh, half of that's not real, and the whole thing will be exactly what happened. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, well, with my crazy life, it'd have to be a series. <laughs> yes. But um, thank you so much, Ramona, and uh, everyone should check out Declara. Thank you so much. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand